Hi, I'm Jason. This video is on asymmetric information. To date in this playlist on game theory, I've assumed perfect information. That is, all players know the rules of the game, the available actions, and the payoffs from each set of actions. I'll now explore two examples where we relax this assumption and allow the parties to have different information. However, we will retain the assumption of rational behavior. The first example involves the market for lemons, drawing on the work of Akerlof. An agent decides to buy a used car. Price P is fixed and quality is unobservable. Suppose there are two types of cars, good cars and lemons. A good car is good with probability Q and a lemon, a car is a lemon with probability one minus Q. The seller knows the type. To the seller, good cars are worth $10,000 and lemons $5,000. To potential buyers, good cars are worth $15,000 and lemons $7,500. Before the purchase, the buyer knows the types of cars in the market and the frequency of each. They only discover the type of car, however, after the purchase. Given both car types are worth more to buyers than sellers, there should exist advantageous trades for both parties for both types of cars. Selling is an efficient solution. But what happens? Let mu be the probability that a car is, that is sold is good. If sellers are willing to sell their cars, mu equals Q. If not, mu equals zero. Therefore, the expected value of a car to a buyer equals 15,000 times mu plus one minus mu times 7,500 equals 7,500 plus 7,500 mu. Hence, the buyer will be willing to pay up to P equals 7,500 plus 7,500 mu. Given the value of each type of car to sellers, they will sell a lemon if P is greater than 5,000 and a good car if P is less than 10,000. Combining the conditions for buyer and seller, a lemon will be sold if the price lies between the minimum required by the seller for the lemon and the maximum the buyer is willing to pay for the lemon. That is, 5,000 is less than or, than or equal to P, which is less than or equal to 7,500 plus 7,500 mu. This relationship holds regardless of the value of mu. So the seller will always be willing and able to sell the lemon. They will be able to sell the good car if 10,000 is less than or equal to P is less than or equal to 7,500 plus 7,500 mu. This relation can only hold if mu is greater than one third. Assuming this risk neutral bias, we're left with two possible equilibria. If Q is greater than or equal to one third, sellers sell both types of cars. That is mu equals Q, which is less than one third, which means that 10,000 will be less than or equal to P, which will be less than or equal to 7,500 plus 7,500 mu. If Q is less than one third, sellers sell only lemons. Mu equals zero. That means the price is between 5,000 and 7,500. Generalizing what is happening here. When buyers cannot observe product quality given P, sellers have an incentive to pass off lemons. Rational buyers expect the seller behavior and they lower their willingness to pay. Prices then decline. Sellers then lower quality further to make profits at the lower prices. Sellers cannot sell high quality cars at high prices, even though buyers would be willing to pay high prices for high quality cars. Quality ultimately declines until nothing but lemons are left. Information asymmetry is sufficient to result in a market failure, even if the agents are rational. The second example involves a phenomenon called the winner's curse. The winner's curse occurs in the context of common value auctions. A common value auction is an auction in which the item for sale has the same value to all bidders. Examples include stocks, which all have one value, and oil, where the amount of oil in a tract is the same for all oil companies. Common value auctions contrast with private value auctions in which bidders have different valuations for the item for sale. This typically occurs where the item's valuation reflects bidder tastes such as art. The winner's curse is a phenomenon in common value auctions whereby the winner tends to experience a loss. 
The term was invented by petroleum engineers in discussing why, why oil companies in the Gulf of Mexico had poor results in the 1950s through 1970s. Oil companies in the Gulf acquiring drilling rights through auctions. Their rights tended to lead to losses or less in profits than expected. In hindsight, the winning bids were unreasonably high. The winner's curse is widely documented in experimental settings and has been observed in corporate environments. I will now walk through a numerical example of the winner's curse. Company one and company two hire a geologist to estimate the value of an oil field. The honest geologist of each company privately reports the estimated valuation to the company. Company one learns V1 and company two learns V2. V1 and V2 are uniformly distributed between zero and 100 and independent. Assume the true value of the oil field is the mean of V1 and V2. That is capital V equals V1 plus V2 on two. The two companies simultaneously bid for the field in a first price auction. The highest bid wins and pays their bid. What should a company bid in this auction? Suppose both companies bid the private valuation they receive. Company one receives V1 equals 50, bids 50 and wins. If they win, V1 equals $50, which is greater than V2. On average, in this state of the world, company two's signal is $25 due to the uniform distribution. The average value of the tract is therefore V bar equals 50 plus 25 on two equals $37.50. The result is that company one has, on average, profit of $37.50 minus 50, which equals $12 minus $12.50. That is a loss of $12.50. Company one now decides to change strategy and bid less than the valuation they receive. What if V1 equals 50 and company one bids $37.50 instead? We'll assume that company two continues to bid V2 and company one wins. If company one wins, $37.50 is greater than V2, which means that, that on average, in this state of the world, companies two signal is $18.75 due to the uniform distribution. The average value of the tract is therefore 50 plus 18.75 on two, which equals $34.37. Company one's profit is on average $34.37 minus $37.50, which equals minus $3.13. Company one now decides to bid only half the valuation. What if V1 equals 50 and company one bids $25? We again assume company two bids V2 and company one wins. If company one wins, 25 is greater than V2. On average, in this state of the world, company two's signal is $12.50 due to the uniform distribution. So the average value of the tract is 50 plus $12.50 on two, which equals $31.25. Company one's profit is $31.25 minus 25, which equals $6.25 on average. However, they will win, win only 20% of the time. Let's now work out the profit maximizing bid in cases where company one wins and company two continues to bid V2. Suppose company, company one bids Delta V1. Company two continues to bid V2 and company one wins. If company one wins, delta V1 is greater than V2. On average, in this state of the world, company two's signal is 0.5 V1 due to the uniform distribution. The average value, sorry, 0.5 delta V1 due to the uniform distribution. The average value of the tract is therefore V1 plus 0.5 delta V1 on two, which equals 0.5 plus 0.25 delta times V1. Company one's net profit is on average 0.5 plus 0.25 delta within brackets times V1 minus delta V1, which equals 0.5 minus 0.75 delta close brackets V1. They make a profit where 0.5 minus 0.75 delta is greater than zero. That is where delta is less than two thirds. The lower delta, the higher their profit, but that is conditional on company one having the winning bid which decreases in probability as they decrease delta. This analysis has a complication in that it does not account for the fact that company two is also a strategic player. We assume company two bids V2, but as for company one, this strategy would lead to an expected loss for company two. 
So what does each firm do at equilibrium? As each firm will have the same strategy at equilibrium, we can solve for company one, assuming company two does the same strategy in response. At equilibrium, we can also assume, also assume that each company will have an expected profit of zero, as each company would otherwise have an incentive to change their bid to gain a share of that profit. Company one will win if delta V1 is greater than delta V2. In other words, if V1 is greater than V2. On average, in this state of the world, company two signal is 0.5 V1 due to uniform distribution. So the average value of the, value of the tract is V1 plus 0.5 V1 on two, which equals 0 0.75 V1. Company one's profit is 0 0.75 V1 minus delta V1 equals 0.75 minus delta V1. Profit is zero when delta equals 0 0.75. The Nash equilibrium is that both parties bid 75% of their private valuation. In summary, bidding based purely on your own valuation fails to take into account that you only win if the other player's signal is low. Alternatively, we may say that winning the auction is bad news regarding the value of the field. This is the winner's curse. Because of the winner's curse, the Nash equilibrium is, equilibrium is to bid more conservatively. The mistake oil companies make is to ignore or underestimate the winner's curse. If an oil company wins an auction, it's likely in part because its geologists have the highest estimates of the field's value. But if all other geologists have lower estimates of the value, the company's geologists have probably overestimated it.